Good day, Grade 12s. Welcome to the second lesson when we are in Physical Science, Grade 12, brought to you by TunAble.org. We started this lesson yesterday when we were discussing the Eastern Cape Common Paper. And I decided to do the Eastern Cape Common Paper because I wanted to go through a common paper with you. And this they're all kind of the same. Um, basically, because all of you should have been writing different exam papers from your different schools. So we're doing revision at the moment. What I'm going to do at the, after I've done the common paper is I'm going to give you a little bit of a test, which I'm hoping you guys will do. And from that, I'll be able to see which sections you are struggling in and then we can go through that. Um, I would like to encourage you to join the turnable.org website for a couple of reasons. The first reason is because you will get access to multiple multiple and scores of material. Okay, tons of material and it's all free. There are exam papers, there's multiple choice questions, there are videos, there are a whole bunch of all, dif all different things and it's all free and it's all to help you do better in your subjects and it's all the subjects, not just science and maths. Okay, secondly, if you join the grade 12 science class, then you can message me, which is actually awesome because if you message me, then what will happen is that I will be able to see the messages. Now, sometimes I will be able to read the messages during the lesson. So I could possibly say to you, what do you guys think? And then you guys could message me. Or what could happen is that if the lesson is a little bit more complicated than that, I you could message me a question um, or a section, or you could say, hey, Candice or Miss Rennie, I didn't really understand um, question four. Can you please go through it again? And if I get enough of those, then what I'll do is I'll say, okay, fine, guys, we didn't quite understand question four. Let's go through it again. Or you could tell me about sections you don't understand. So messaging me is great. I really want this to become a basic lesson plan or lesson structure where you guys give me feedback as well as to what you need to learn. Right, so we were going through the June common paper and I left you guys at this point yesterday where we were saying that we needed to wait done that. There we go. We said the crate accelerates parallel down the inclined plane for a distance of 0.9 meters at 1,24 meters per second squared. So we've got the acceleration, we've got the displacement. Use the work energy theorem and calculate the work done by the man on the crate, by the man on the crate. Okay. So there are a couple of things that we need to talk about. So the first thing I need to do is get a pen out. I don't know what happened to my pen. So let's get another pen out. Choose green. Okay, first of all, we said that the work energy theorem stated that W net, the network done, was equal to the change in kinetic energy. And that was very important because they wouldn't ask us to state the work energy theorem unless we were going to use it. Okay, then we realized that we could work out the change, Vf squared minus Vi squared, of this crate since we had its acceleration and we had the displacement. And why was that important? Because network is equal to the change in kinetic energy, which is the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy, which is a half m, you can take that as a common factor, and you're left with Vf squared minus Vr squared. Okay, so I can work out what this is. Isn't that wonderful? Which is what we did yesterday. I'm just reminding you so that we can move on. So we substitute in the 1,24 and the 0,9 and we get V of squared minus V I squared. And I'm going to get out my calculator and we're going to pop that in our calculator. So don't freak out if this calculator looks a little bit more complex than yours. In fact, some of you might have way better calculators than this. This is just an emulator that I've managed to download that works very similar to the, either the Casio or the Sharp calculators that you guys use. Okay, so we're doing 2 times 1.24 times 0.9. That's what we're doing. So 
Let's do it. It's 2 times 1.24 times 0 0.9 equals that thing there, which doesn't help at all. So what we're going to do is write the SD button and it's 223 comma 2. 223 comma 2. Does that look right to you? No, it doesn't, because that's supposed to be 1, 24. So let's go back, delete, delete, delete. And this, actually, this is good that you guys see this, because what you always need to do is check that what you are working out is actually makes sense, okay? So let's try again. 2 times 1.24 times 0, 0,9 equals... So that means 279 over 125 is, that's much better, 2.232, 2.232. So that means that VF squared minus VI squared is equal to 2 comma 3, I'm just going to leave it at 2 comma 3. Let me just check it again. 2 comma 232, oh, sorry, I don't know where my head is tonight. 2 comma 2, 3, 2. Let's do that. And I'm not going to round off just yet because of the fact that then we'll get rounding error. So that there would fit in here. Okay. So do you agree we could then work out our delta K? All right. Happy with that. But now I'm going to erase this and I'm so that I have more space and then we're going to carry on working. I'm not worried about you guys losing this because obviously this is a video so you can go and watch it again. So let's erase all our work. <sighs> Actually I don't really want to erase. Yeah okay erase all the work. I did not do it. Oh I know why. Okay fine. So the reason it didn't erase all the work is because this was saved onto it. Okay so <laughs> right what we need to do now is just work around it. Okay, so now we've got this value, VF minus VI squared, which is 2 comma 232. Okay, so now we need to work out the network done. But earlier, we had to do a free body diagram. And there is again a reason why they ask you to do the free body diagram. Why? Because we said, remember, that F delta X equals the network. Okay, right? Or we could think of it this way, that, so we could work out the network done and multiply it by the displacement, okay? Okay, or we could think about what work was happening here. So let's do that. Guys, I'm actually going to do this. Let me just go quickly, um, yeah. And I'm going to go here, yeah, and I'm just going to delete all this so we have space. Right, and we're going to resume the slideshow. There you go. That's much better. Okay, now we've got space. So now we can carry on with what we're doing. So the only thing I really, really wanted out of this was the free body diagram. So the free body diagram goes like this, and there is your normal force up here, if normal. There's the force of gravity down here, if G. There was the big force of the man. This is the force of the man. And then there was the force of friction, force of friction. Okay, and that was our free body diagram. And that was important because of the fact that we need that for this question. And that's why I was worried about erasing everything. Right, so now we can carry on with this question. Okay, so let's go. So we are going to work on the fact that we know that W net is equal to delta K. We know delta K, we can get it. We know that delta K is going to be a half M VF squared minus VI squared, right? We've just shown that VF squared minus VI squared is 2 comma, it's 2 again, 2, 3, 2. So therefore, I can say that delta K is a half times the mass of the object, which is 86, times the VF squared minus VI squared, which is 2 comma 2, 3, 2. Okay, and I'm going to pop that in my calculator so I can work out what my change in kinetic energy is, and then we've got a number for that. So let's do that. And we move it over, and we clear it, and we go 
0.5 times 86 times 2.232 equals and that doesn't help so we need to change it and becomes 95,976 and remember you always round off to two decimal places so that's 95,98 so that's 95,98 joules so that is the kinetic energy that has been gained by this crate now that is equal to the network done but let's talk about the network the network done is equal to the work done by the man plus the work done by gravity pulling it down the slope plus and I'm doing pluses because remember we're always looking for the sum of everything always plus the work of friction okay and this is the one that we're trying to work out okay but all of this is equal to 95.98 Okay, can we work out the work done due to gravity? Yes, we can, because this is a horizontal component. You need to understand that this is the force of gravity, but remember that this is straight down into the ground. And that is doing two things. It's got two components. There is the vertical component and the horizontal component. This vertical component is equal to the normal force and that is what's keeping this crate basically on the ground okay if the normal force was there alone then actually this crate would fly off and if this was alone for coming down into the earth then obviously this would sink down these two balance each other out this component here the horizontal component is parallel with the ground and that pulls the crate down the slope so this is fg parallel and it pulls it down the slope okay do you understand that so that there is going to be the work done by gravity so that there is the force that is going to be used to do work by gravity so now we're working out the work done by man now we need to work out the work done by gravity but remember that work done by gravity is always well, work done, should I say, work done is always F delta X, okay? And in this case, delta X is 0.9, we've got it. So let's work out this force here. And I know that your formula sheet said F W X delta X cos theta. Okay, now let me talk to you about this cos theta because it worries me. And the reason it worries me is because this is on an incline. This cos theta only comes into play when the force applied is at an angle to the surface. It is only comes into play when this angle is at a surface. In other words, if you've got a surface and you've got a block and you're pulling at an angle, then we worry about cos theta. Okay, because it is taking account the fact that it is at an angle. So even then, if we were at a slope here, if you were pulling at an angle up to the surface, then that there, that's that cos theta. Otherwise, otherwise, we are only looking at F delta X cos theta, where it's either going to be zero or 180 degrees. Okay, and the zero, is when you're going in the same direction and 180 degrees is when you're going in the opposite direction in other words delta x is either going to be positive or negative okay so i worry about this because a lot of people then just see f delta x cos theta on their formula sheets and they pop in the 25 degrees when in fact in this case if the force is parallel to the surface your only values for theta can either be zero or 180 degrees zero is when the force is in the direction of the movement and 180 degrees is when it's opposite because cos of 180 degrees is minus one okay so that's why i tend to leave out that cos theta but i'm gonna have to fill it in now so that you guys understand what's going on so that's why i decided to explain it right so let's talk about wg sorry i seem to be going off on tangents all the time so this angle here is 25 degrees so that means that that little angle there is 25 degrees how do i get that well i'm dropping a perpendicular down here that is fg 
Therefore, that is 90 degrees, okay? And if you want to, you can realize that that there is FG parallel, it's the horizontal component, and then that would be the vertical component, FG perpendicular. And then this here is also FG parallel. FG. So if this is 25 degrees and that is 90, then do you agree that this angle here would be 90 minus 25 degrees, would, but this is a 90 degree angle, so that leaves that to be 25 degrees there. Okay, so you can either work it out or you guys can just learn it, knowing most of the students that I've ever taught, you guys just learn that the angle inside the slope is equal to that little angle there, which is 25 degrees, but it's nice to know how you get it, hey? Okay, right, so now we are working out this component here, and we're looking at that triangle there. So this is FG, which is equal to 86 times by 9,8, because it's mass times gravity, right? This here is the opposite side to the angle and this is the hypotenuse so if we were doing circa do you agree that I'd be looking at the opposite side and the hypotenuse the opposite side and the hypotenuse so therefore I can say that FG parallel is equal to this year which is FG sine sine 25 degrees okay where fg is 9 comma uh, 80, 86 times 9 comma 8 so i'm going to fill that in over here so i'm going to say that the weight the work done due to gravity is 86 times 9 comma 8 sine 25 degrees and then times by our naught comma nine, which is our delta x, the displacement down the slope, times by cos of zero. And why? Because the force of gravity is in this direction and they say it's accelerating down the slope. Okay, so that's WG. Now we need to work out WF. Now, yesterday we worked out the, what did we work out? Did we work out the force of friction? Yes, we did. We worked out the force of friction to be 168,04 newtons. In fact, I'm going to change color so you can see what I'm doing. Mm, terrible color. Oh, they won't let me change. There we go. There we go. So we know that the force of friction is going up. Right? The force of friction is going up. Okay, and that means it's in the opposite direction. So again, if we're applying this rule, what does cos, what does this theta have to be? It has to be 180 degrees. So therefore, we've got the F, which we worked out yesterday, to be 168,04. So we're going to go plus 168,04 times by 0,9 times by cos of 180 degrees. And all of that, and I'm just putting this number onto this side so that you can see it, is equal to 95,98. Okay, so do you agree then that I can now just work out what the work done was done by the man? So let's put this into our calculators. So the first thing I'm going to do just find a place with my calculator. The first thing I'm going to do is multiply out the work done by gravity. So that there is going to be 86 times 9,8 times sine, and I know I don't really have to do the times, but I'm going to do it anyway, times sine, close my bracket, times the displacement of 0, 0,9, 0, 0,9, and then I have to multiply it by cos zero. 
So then I multiply it by my cos of zero. And again, grade 12s, as always, I need to stress that you need to make sure that there's not a big R or big G here. Yeah? Ideally, your calculator should show a D for decimal over here, but if it is not showing a D for decimal, it definitely shouldn't be say, showing a big R because that stands for radians. And that means you're in the wrong mathematical mode and your whole sum is going to be wrong. Right, so let's press equals and we get 320.5644, 320.5644. So I'm going to write that down, 320.5644. Now I'm going to do this one on the calculator. And if you're wondering why I'm doing all of them on the calculator and showing you and not just giving you the answers is because I have found that a lot of my students struggle with calculator work because it's not really taught at school properly. So I find that they make silly, silly, silly mistakes. 168 comma 04 and that loses the marks. So I like to show it. Times by 0, 9 times by cos of 180 close brackets equals and that is negative this fraction and remember we don't like the fraction so we're changing it to SD so this becomes minus 151.236 so that is minus 151.236 plus the work done by the man is going to equal 95,98 so do you agree I can just pop these numbers in the calculator now 95.98. So let's do that. So I'm going to take all of those across, and when I take them across, this oopsie, sorry, this becomes positive, and that becomes positive. That becomes negative, and this becomes positive. So we've got. Let's clear it. 95.98. 95.98 minus. Let's move this across. 320.5644, and I'm going to leave those numbers then round off at the end. So we've got minus 320.5644 plus 151.236. Okay, oh, I made a mistake. There should be a one there. Let's go back, delete, 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 delete. And it becomes 151.236 equals. And again, I press the button and I get a minus number. It's minus 73.348. So I'm going to round it off to minus 73.35. So the work done by the man, and I'm going to write it down here, is minus 73, comma, let's go back, 0.35, right? Because the 8 is bigger than 5, so we're rounding off here. So it's, it's minus 73, comma, 35. 35 joules and that is the work done by the man on the crate sure a lot of work okay that is one way to do it the other way to do it is to do forces but i'm not going to spend time now doing this question and doing the forces what i'm rather going to do is the next time we come to a question like this then i will do it using net force instead of network okay because otherwise we're never going to get on to question four okay let's move on let's do question four okay it says a five kilogram rigid crate moves from rest so the initial velocity is zero down the path a b c in the diagram below section a and b is frictionless there's no loss of energy here, right? While section BC is rough, assume that the crate moves in a straight line down the path. Okay, it's not going zigzag down a mountain. So the first question is, state in words the principle of the conservation of mechanical energy. So if you were with us yesterday when we did the lesson, okay, I told you guys that um, I told you guys that sorry if you I told you guys that in order to 
be make sure that you understand how to do a question, you need to look at what the first theory question is. And the very first question is that you need to realize that they are saying to you that you are going to be using the principle of conservation of mechanical energy in this question. You are going to use the principle of conservation of mechanical energy in this question. Okay, so let's have a look at this. What is the definition of the principle of conservation of mechanical energy? It says the total mechanical energy in an isolated system remains constant Okay, and what is an isolated system? It means that there is no external force or no conservative force. So what does it say? What it says again? It says the total mechanical energy of an isolated system remains constant. Total mechanical energy remains constant. Okay, so that is what we're saying. So we're going to be using the conservation of mechanical energy. Now it says use the principle of conservation of mechanical energy to calculate the velocity of the crate when it reaches point B. Right, so what is the conservation of mechanical energy? It is saying that E mech at point A equals E mech at point B. The mechanical energy at A equals the mechanical energy at B. That is what it's saying. So, what does a mechanical energy may be made up of? It is made up of potential energy and kinetic energy. So, you've got potential energy, which we either write as EP plus EK, and that's all at A, has to equal EP plus EK, all at B. And we're going to use this where EP or it's called U as well, is equal to MGH. And EK is equal to K, which equals a half MV squared. Now, what I would like to do is I would like to give you just a few minutes, like two or three minutes, just to try and work this out for yourselves. And then once we've done that, see how you do. I know it's not a long time, but I just wanted you to start it. Just think about it. And then I will carry on. So just start that for a second. Right, great tool. So how did you do?
I hate leaving you guys to do this, but it's so hard for me not to make let you at least have a little bit of a try before we carry on. So let's carry on. We've got mechanical energy at A plus the kinetic energy at A has to equal the potential energy at B plus the kinetic energy at B. Okay, so there are two ways to do this, and the one way is to look just at this point here, this distance here, okay? And that is to realize, therefore, that A is 4 meters above B, okay? So, therefore, we can assume that as far as we're concerned between A and B, B is at ground level. So, therefore, this height here between these two is 0 and 4 meters, okay? That's the one way. So I'm going to use that may, and then I'm going to mention the other way to you, okay? So the one way is to do that, and that is then to look at the mechanical energy at A. Now let's talk about the created A. Do you agree that it's got an initial velocity of zero? Therefore, does it have any kinetic energy? No, it does not have any kinetic energy. Okay, so if that's the case, we've got... MGH, MGH plus zero at A, okay, is equal to the potential energy at B plus the kinetic energy at B, okay, the potential energy at B plus the kinetic energy at B, okay. So, what does that mean? If we look at it from my point of view, this means that this here is zero height, Okay, which means there's no potential energy, plus, but there is a kinetic energy of a half mv squared. Okay, and now what do they want? They want us to work the velocity out here at b, so we can solve for b. So we've got mgh is equal to half mv squared. mgh is equal to half mv squared. Okay, now we've been told that the mass is five kilograms, but I want to mention to you that a lot of times you get a question and a similar question where they don't give you the mass. And then my students go, oh, we can't do the question, we don't have the mass. But the mass of the object does not change between year and year. It hasn't dropped off a limb, it hasn't lost parts, it stayed the same. So we can cancel these M's. Okay, if it stays the same, we can cancel them. And then you can still solve this without knowing that mass. Therefore, we can say that GH is equal to a half V squared. Okay, therefore, we're solving for this. We get 2GH is equal to V squared. Therefore, we can say V is equal to the square root of 2GH. So therefore, that is equal to the square root of 2 times 9.8 times by the height of 4, okay? And then we're just going to pop that in our calculator. So we have the square root of 2 times 9.8 times 4 equals, which becomes 8.8. 8.85 meters per second. So that equals 8.85 meters per second. Okay. Now, what I want you to realize is if you decided that that wasn't ground level, then you could still have done the sum. It's just that you would have had potential energy over here. So let's just show you that quickly, just to make sure you would have got that right if you did it that way. You would have had at A, you would have had MGH plus EK, okay, and at B, you would have had MGH plus a half MV squared. The MGH over here, because if you don't think of this as zero, the whole of this is what? It is five meters. So then you've got the mass, which we don't care about. This is 9,8 times by five, is the mass of this, again, which we don't care about, 9,8, but then the height of this is 1 meter, plus a half times the mass, which we don't care about, and then V squared. So then we cancel all our masses, and we take this across, and we end up with 9,8 times by 5, 
minus 9,8 times by 1, I know I didn't really have to write the times for 1, is equal to half v squared. And if you have a look at that, you will see that it actually works out to be the same, because what are we doing? We're going 9.8 times 5 minus 9.8 times 1, which just 4 times 9,8 is equal to a half v squared. And we end up with exactly the same solution. So it doesn't matter whether or not you chose this to be the ground level for the sum or not, you're going to get the same value. Right, let's do the second part of this question, or the third part of this question. Okay, let me erase my writing. It says, on reaching point B, the crate continues to move down section BC, but remember section BC was all got lots and lots of friction, okay? It experiences an average frictional force of 10 newtons, so there's 10 newtons upwards, okay? And it reaches point C at a velocity of 4 meters per second. Now, we've just worked out that it got to this point with a velocity of 8,85 meters per second, right? So now let's see what the question is. It says, apart from friction, write down the name of two forces that act on the crate as it moves down this section. Apart from friction. Well, there's obviously the force of gravity. And then what is the other force? It is going to be the normal force. Okay, what they're doing really is asking you to write out the forces and sort of drawing a free body diagram. If I had asked you to draw a free body diagram of that, you'd have gone, well, that's pretty easy. Here's my dot. That is the force of gravity. That's my normal force, F normal. And that is my force of friction. Now they've just asked you to write it out instead. So if you struggle with questions like this, draw the thing and then write them out. Now they say, in which direction does the net force act on the crate? Write down only B to C or C to B, and it's only one mark, okay? Well, let's think about this way. It starts off here at 8,85 meters per second, and it ends up at 4 meters per second. And we know that F net is equal to MA. MA, okay? So your net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And the acceleration is your change in velocity over change in time. And if you want to extend it further, this is equal to VF minus VI. So if we just had to do this bit here, do you agree it would be 4 minus 8,85, which is negative? Okay, which means we've got a negative acceleration, which means we've got a negative net force. And what does negative mean when we're talking vectors? It means opposite to the direction of motion. A minus sign when we're talking forces can be actually quantifiable, but it's usually to do with direction. Okay, so which way is the net force going? It is going from C to B. It's going up the hill. Now it says, another crate of mass 10 kilograms now moves from point A along B to point C. Okay, so we've got a new crate and now it's got a mass of 10 kgs. And the question is, let me just erase all this. How will the velocity of this 10 kilogram crate at point B compared to that of 5 kilogram crate at B? And you only have to write down greater than, smaller than, or equal to, greater, smaller, or equal to. Okay, and the answer is equal to. Okay, why is that? Well, if you remember, I showed you that you could cancel out the masses when we worked out the velocity. Remember I showed you that if we look just at this bit here, okay, then we'd have um, EP plus EK at A is equal to EP plus EK at B. We have no kinetic energy at A, and if we're looking at it from here to here, in other words, we're pretending this is ground level, then we have no potential energy. So I said we had MGH 
is equal to a half mv squared. And do you remember I said we could cancel out the m's? So for that reason alone, we know that it is equal. But the scientific reason behind that is that the fact is that the only force that's acting on this, okay, other than the normal force, is the force of gravity. And the force of gravity is independent of mass and it acts over the same distance. Okay, so it's independent of mass. Typical example that I like to tell my students is if I take a an elephant and I put it in a three meter by three meter by three meter crate and I take a rabbit and I also put it in a three meter by three meter by three meter crate and I chuck them out of an airplane they will land, and I say land, not crash land. We will stop them. We will put on, I don't know, mattresses, and we will deploy the parachutes just before they hit the ground. They will touch the ground at exactly the same time. And the reason is because the force of gravity is independent of mass. Okay. Right. Let's move on. Ooh. A submarine can use the Doppler effect to detect the speed of a ship. A submarine at rest, so the submarine's at rest and just below the surface water, detects the frequency of a moving ship as 537 hertz, which is 0 0.85 times the actual frequency of sound emitted by the ship. The speed of sound in water is 1,470 meters per second. So the next thing they say is state the Doppler effect in words. So if you hadn't realized that this question was about the Doppler effect from the statement, the fact that they've asked you to state the Doppler effect in words gives you that huge hint. Okay, and as I said yesterday, please, guys, please go and learn your theory, okay? You can gain or lose up to 10% in an exam just by not being able to state these things. And you need to be careful. You need to learn it word perfect because there's specific words that the teachers and the markers look for to make sure that your inverted commas understand the concept, okay? And if you leave out those words, even though they may seem insignificant to you, they are going to penalize you. So it says state the Doppler effect in words. And the Doppler effect says that it is the apparent change. That is one of those important words. It is the apparent change in the detected or observed, observed frequency. Okay. That is what they are looking for. Apparent or as the result of the relative motion between a source and an observer. So it's a change, an apparent change in observed frequency due to the relative motion between the source and an observer. Okay, so everything has to do with the relative motion and like we said, it's an apparent change because there isn't actually a change in the frequency. There's just an apparent change. Right, so now they ask us, is the ship moving towards us or away from us? And we just have to give moving towards away or towards and give a reason and the correct answer is that it is moving away from us it is moving away and the reason for that is because the detected or observed frequency is lower than the actual frequency it actually tells you that yeah it says that it detects a frequency of 437 hertz which is 0 0.985 times the actual frequency of the sound. It is less, 0 0.985 is less than the actual frequency. So the detected frequency, frequency is smaller than the actual frequency. And let me explain that in a diagram. Okay, so yeah, we have an object and it is radiating sound at 360 degrees. Okay, that's how it works. These are supposed to be perfect circles. So I apologize. Okay, so it's radiating sound in a perfect circle all the way through 360, right? Now let's say this object starts to move. So the object's moving, but it's still radiating 
energy I and mean, we're still re radiating the sound it's giving off the sound energy so what happens is that as it moves it starts catching up with these wave fronts so you end up with something that looks like that okay so the wave front or the frequency of the waves tend to be closer together if the object is approaching so it's moving this way right so if i'm standing here i am going to hear a higher frequency okay if i'm standing over here i'm going to hear a lower frequency because these wave fronts are getting further and further apart because the object is moving away so in this case the little submarine is actually standing over here and he's hearing the boat move away from him because the detected frequency is actually smaller than the actual frequency right and that grade 12 is enough for today please join me tomorrow where we carry on with the next lesson and the next part of this lesson have a wonderful day